two votes. Um, folks, I just ask because of any one person in this church that is because of the church that we have. And um, it just, I was just proud of it all. All of, our, all of our students stood out in one way or another this weekend. Um, but it was just... It was just awesome to see, and from us to you guys, thank you, because it is impossible without you guys. Thank you very much.
There's no one that compares to you. You are perfect in all of your ways. We love you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, our Savior. You are good, and your mercy endures forever. Good. I got one hearing aid out and one in, so I'm coming out. <laughs> Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is my God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, but Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at the Zotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. <laughs> Romans 8 28, the New King James Version says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to, to love God, to those who are called. And a translation called The Voice, I hadn't heard before, it says, We are confident that God is able to orchestrate everything, to work towards something good and beautiful when we love him and accept his invitation to live according to his plan. Is this going in now? I'll try not to yell at this thing. So on Good Friday, there were many of us standing out across on the side of the road. Aaron and I happened to be in front of Siegel. Standing there, we saw this truck approaching, and we talked about how neat it was, because it was proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
He stopped at the light, and Aaron continued standing there, and I mean, we were just sitting there talking. And at one point, I turned toward Signal, and there stood Wes. He was by the gas pump. He had this big smile on his face, and we waved, and we all went about our, our day, you know, I and mean, we didn't think nothing of it. Well, then later, that shows up on Facebook. I was stunned. I had no idea. Christopher Roberts referred to it as a God wave. So now I'm going to back up to March 12th. I stayed on Facebook that God puts the right people in the right place at the right time. And here a few weeks later, we're proclaiming Jesus Christ as King. But now I'm going to back up even further. In 2012, I was diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, also known as AFib. And if you don't know what it is, it's when your heart, it, it just goes nuts. You'll be sitting there doing it, doing 60 beats a minute, and all of a sudden it'll jump up to 150 and back to 60, and it's all over the place. This went on until January of this year. I had what's called ablations. I've had two of them. It's correct this issue with no positive results. Talking to a nurse at work, she connected me with another doctor up in Springfield. And in the fall of last year, they recommended another ablation. I was like, I have no way I'm not doing this again. You can look it up what it does. But Brenda and I decided to do this one more time. You notice Brenda and I decided to do this one more time. <laughs> the lady going over everything with us stated she must go over the risks. I told her that I knew the risks and I wasn't worried about them because I knew Jesus. Amen. Brenda and I smiled at the lady and, and I'm not sure what she thought, but she continued. So anyway, surgery was scheduled for January 14th. The Sunday before, our Sunday school class held hands with me and we prayed. So surgery happened and a few weeks later a follow-up. The doctor stated that everything looked good and asked how I would feel about getting off my medications. I said I'd be relieved. So another follow-up to that appointment, and the doctor took me off the two medications I was on. I have not had a fit since the surgery. I believe there was a purpose to all of this. I also believe that God put us in contact with the right doctor Amen. in the right place at the right time. I believe God gave this doctor the ability to perform such an intricate surgery that God used him to bring healing to me. I believe that many of us in here have a similar story of God bringing the right person to the right place at the right time. That's Leonard. So I have here two empty bottles. They are empty. Once filled with a treatment, but not a cure. There isn't anything on this planet that can cure us. Nothing that can heal us, nothing that can carry us through. Only Jesus Christ. Amen. We know the history of the communion meal you're about to participate in. As you prepare to take these emblems, I will ask, are you seeking him? Have you found him? Have you seen him in everyday life but didn't realize it? I can assure you that God is with us. God wants us. He sent his, his son on, to die on the cross so that we can join him in heaven one day. And I ask that you take these emblems this morning. Thank God for his son. Thank him for where you are in life right now. It may not be pretty, but there's something to be learned and something God has control over. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you know him as your personal Savior, Please join us at this time of communion.
Spirit and Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this precious cup. We thank you for the moments in time, the moments in our lives here. We thank you for these weeks. Thank you for all that you've done, that you're doing, that you will continue to do with us and through us, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name.
get started this morning. First of all, Austin, apologies. I mispronounced your last name. It's Dias, not Dagger. <laughs> Dias, S, not R. All right. Secondly, um, we have a few students who just got up and left. They are going to Creative Arts Academy at Ozark Christian College this week. They're going to learn um, various things as they deal with technical arts and, and the worship arts. Um, so uh, just be in prayer for them this week as they are all doing their various things. Uh, as we get started this morning, we will be in Psalm chapter 36 this morning as we continue to look at David's psalms. And, and again, David singing to God. And in this morning's uh, message, it's entitled, Their Word. Their word. But let's go to God this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we pray. We pray that your will be done. God, we pray that you would speak to us this morning through your word. Father, that it wouldn't be about any of us. It would be about what we think, God. About what our society thinks. About what our nation thinks, God. But about what you think and what your word says. And God, may we hold on to those truths. May we hang on to them diligently until Jesus Christ either comes back or you call us home. Father, again, we thank you for this morning. We thank you so much for the blood of the Lamb that has covered uh, that has covered us all this morning. God, that we have seen in action as Austin has proclaimed faith in you, has clothed himself in you this morning, God. And I pray that if anyone in this room needs that clothing, that they would do that today, God, and not delay. God, thank you so much for your love and your protection. And we pray all this right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. In the book of Psalm 36. If you have your Bibles, we're going to just jump right into verse 1 this morning. And verse 1, if I can say anything about the first few verses of Psalm 36, it is that first point in moral compass. And that, and that point in moral compass, we'll come back to it in just a second. But look at verse 1 with me. I have a message from God in my heart, David said, concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. Not necessarily just sinfulness, but the heart of the wicked. I have a message from God. And here's that message. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And, and pause and just think about that for just one moment. It's not only really that there's not a fear of God. It's there's, there's no fear of judgment from God in their eyes. So here's the idea. I spent this entire week teaching a relevant issues class at church camp to high school seniors and college graduates. Or high school graduates. Okay, the relevant issues class, again, I talked a little bit about this last week, but it was super easy to do. Because our current society is making relevant things relevant. Yeah. And I can get offended about anything. We tackled ideas like critical race theory. What is critical race theory? Critical race theory is the idea that, listen, I, and I'm not here to offend anybody. I'm going to let God's word do that, all right? Not me, but God's word. I'm just going to tell you straight up the truth in all this. Critical race theory says this. If you are white, then you are bad. Look it up. If you're white, you're bad. And we talked about that. Now, what does that mean? Because in Ephesians chapter 2, it says that God broke down every dividing wall. There is neither black nor white in God's family. Okay, there's neither male nor female, there's neither slave nor free. Okay, there's nothing if you are in Jesus Christ. And then we went on and we talked about the LGBT community this week. And we didn't have time to talk about everything. But here's the thing with all of it. We spent all day Monday talking about if this is not our moral compass, then it does not matter what I believe. Because listen, who told you that you shouldn't commit murder? Who told you that it's wrong to steal somebody's stuff? Who told you that it's wrong? If you want something, you go get it. In fact, our society teaches us, if you want something bad enough, you go get it. Boy. Our society also tells us that the heart wants what the heart wants. If your heart is dead set on it, you go get it. Because that's what your heart wants. You know that it's from 1862? Emily Dickens wrote, a letter to a friend in 1862. Her friend was dealing with some issues. Her husband was leaving. Okay? It, not, not the leaving like you think, like he was leaving her. No, that's not it. They were going to be separated for time. And within that separation, she writes these words. The heart wants what the heart wants. Now that sounds great. That sounds so good, doesn't it? The heart wants what the heart wants. If you have your Bible. 
about this. We'll go to Jeremiah chapter 17. I think these verses are going to be up on the screen as well. In my Bible, I have verses 9 to 10 highlighted. And look at how Jeremiah starts. And, and Jeremiah is quoting God here, okay? Jeremiah is quoting God. He was a prophet of God. He's quoting God. Look what Jeremiah says. Quoting God here. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Wait, wait. But the heart wants what the heart wants. I want what I want. Why, why can't I have my heart's desire? Because there's sometimes your heart lies to you. And it's not for good. And so Jeremiah says, again, quote God, the heart is deceitful above all things. Look at verse 10 with me. I don't have verse 10 up here, I don't believe. But it's in your Bible. I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Now go back to what David says in Psalm 36, verse 1. There is no fear of God before their eyes. I just finished listening to a book this past week by a lady named Rachel Gilson. Rachel Gilson said this, and I posted this quote online, but I didn't say who it was from. Rachel Gilson says this, If I am only willing to obey what I both agree and understand, how am I not making myself God? I'm going to read that again, and I hope you write that down somewhere. If I am only willing to obey when I both agree and understand how I might not making myself God. Here's the thing. The moment I think I've got this all figured out, that makes me God. Oh, wait. I'm not God. Never mind. I don't have it all figured out. It's okay. I'm never going to get there. I'm okay with that. So sometimes when you ask me questions and I can't give you an answer, please remember that I'm finite. I'm a human being. There's a lot more educated people in this room than me. Okay? But here's what happens. When we don't care about God's judgment, when we don't care about who God is, this is what happens. We misplace our morality. We misplace our morality. Look at verses 2, 3, and 4 with me. In their own eyes, they flatter themselves too much to detect or hate their sin. The words of their mouth are wicked and deceitful. They fail to act wisely or to do good. Even on their beds, they plot evil. They commit themselves to sinful course and do not reject what is wrong. And you can just leave those verses up there if you would, Lisa. Verse 2, in their own eyes, they flatter themselves. Psalm 10, verse 2, talks about kind of this contrast. It says that, you know what? The wicked man is going to boast of his wickedness and he's going to revile God at the same time. Again, i got to share if this is not our moral compass, then we're free to do what we want to do. However, in our freedom to do what we want to do, we have to remember that one day I'm going to stand before the guy who pinned this. 2 Timothy 3.16, for all scripture is God breathed. 2 Peter. Chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. None of this came about by man's own interpretation. He was moved by the Holy Spirit. He wrote. And this word, in their own eyes, they flatter themselves. The Hebrew word for flatter there basically is this boasting or a separation. And in part, the word can mean separation. They separate themselves. From that which is good. <laughs> if you have your Bible, look over Romans chapter 16 with me. This is the same word when translated into the New Testament. Romans 16 uses the same word for flattery. When we get down to verse 17, Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions. Who put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching that you have learned. Now, again, if I'm not in this, then I don't have a moral compass. If I don't know what the moral compass is, it's like keeping it in a bag and going, I'm not sure what direction I'm going to go here. Paul says, you haven't learned Christ that way. Okay, Paul says, you've learned this. Keep on learning these things. And look at what he continues to say. For such people, verse 18, are not serving our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. And I stop there for just a moment because I think, hmm, this 
seems to suggest that there are people living in their midst who are teaching these things, who are doing these things. They're coming to church with them. They are participating in their groups. Yet, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those people who cause divisions and put obstacles in the way. Verse 18 again, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. And that word for naive would just be unlearned. The idea that you haven't studied well enough to know. And that's okay. I mean, it's okay to be ignorant in some things. But we should be growing to maturity, God's word says. In Jude chapter 1, because there's only one chapter of Jude, <laughs> verses 3 and 4, look with me. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about salvation that we share, I was compelled to write to you. And urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. Here it is, verse 4. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in. Now, nobody's going to come right out and say, listen, this is what I believe. No, they're secretly. Because that's how Satan wants to operate. He doesn't want to just flat out tell you. They secretly come in. Who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Listen, there's a movement right now starting in the United States of America. I don't know if it's starting in the United States of America. It just seems like it's starting in the United States of America. There's this idea of progressive Christianity. Has anybody ever heard the term progressive Christianity? <laughs> Handful of us have heard of progressive Christianity. Progressive Christianity says that we are moving, the, the, the word of God is progressing to a higher morality. The word of God is moving to a higher morality, which means those of you who condemn the LGBT community, those of you who condemn them, You are not speaking what God wants you to speak. Because God is love. And God wants you to accept. And listen. Okay, listen. I am, I am not saying that we condemn anybody in the LGBTQ community to help. We have no right to do that. However, our right is to tell them what God says. God's word says Romans chapter 1. Okay? God's word says Galatians chapter 5. Now listen. They say that if you, if you speak bad, condemn, speak against it, if you don't let these people in and let them be co-heirs, then you've got it wrong. You fundamental Christian Jew. And, and there's this idea that they're starting to bring these heresies in. This is the word of God, and it's the inherent word of God, yet there are things that are open for your own personal interpretation where you can allow what our society says is to be right correspond with what the Bible says. You catch that. Allowing our society to dictate what the word of God says. Now, I don't have time to talk about all of it this morning. Okay? But if you have time, I'm telling you, just look at a, YouTube, a few YouTube videos, and it will kind of give you help in what progressive Christianity is. I watched a video with a guy named Colby Martin, and you know what? I, have, I, I believe Colby has a sincere heart for Jesus, but I believe his theology is wrong, and I'm going to call him out on it. I believe his theology is wrong. I've never met the man, but I have never wanted to throw my computer screen so much watching this interview with this man. Kind of like when you know what's going to happen in a movie and you're yelling at the TV. This is what I'm doing in my office while I'm watching him. We cannot let society dictate what the Word of God says. And that's exactly what David says in Psalm 36. Go back to Psalm 36 with me. As I lost my place. In their own eyes, they flatter themselves too much to 
reject or hate their sin. The words of their mouths are wicked and deceitful. And they fail to act wisely and do good. Even on their beds, these such people devise evil. Listen, this past week I was reading the Gospels. And it's interesting to me that this young lady comes in and she anoints Jesus' head and his feet with oil. And all of a sudden, all the disciples are going, man, this, this is such a waste. This oil could have been sold, the money given to the poor. And we find out in that gospel that Judas Iscariot was the instigator of this. And the only reason why Judas instigated it was because this was taking money out of his pocket. How dare Jesus take money out of my pocket? He should have condemned this woman for breaking open this oil. And I love what Jesus does. Jesus says, leave her alone. Stop it. And then the very next thing you see in that gospel is Judas finding a way to get Jesus condemned to death. Hey, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? How can I get ahead in this deal? He's not going to do what I want him to do. Did you catch that? He's not going to do what I want him to do. So I'm going to get ahead in my own game here. If I'm only willing to obey when I both agree and understand, how am I not making myself God? I don't understand why things have to happen, but that's what makes him God. And it says in the word of God that they, they invent ways of doing evil. Jeremiah 32, 35, Romans 1, 30. We have no problems. We have no problems in many ways of doing evil. Look at what Paul says to the church of Rome. Slanders, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. And disobey their parents. And so on and so on. But the reality is, is we don't need any help doing bad. We don't need help. And David, and David says, they don't need help. But then you have to get to the character of God in verses 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I have so much more I want to say, but we must move on for time. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountain. And justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. And it's at that point I stopped because I was listening to this while I was trail running yesterday in this psalm. And then all of a sudden I just busted out this the third day. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Your love reaches to the hair of our hands. <laughs> your justice flows. Okay, anyway, sorry. My feet. Okay, all right. So I'm just sitting here thinking about this, but it's so good because this is scripture. But it talks about God's love. How far is it? Higher than we can go. Amen. How deep is it? Deeper than we can go. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. And here it is. How priceless. How priceless is your own love? I asked this question last week. Um, Aaron and I were talking about this. And I asked this question. I said, how much would it take? How much would it take for you to sell out Jesus? How much would it take? And before we go up and go, it would take all, it would, you know, there's nothing that it would take. Let's stop for just a second and say, but really, how much would it take for you to sell out Jesus? Can you put an amount to it? Is there a dollar amount that somebody would to walk up to you and go, if you'll quit going to church, quit hanging out with Christian people, if you will stop confessing Jesus Christ, I will write you a check for how much? How much would it take to suffer? What does it profit a man to gain the world and forfeit his soul? But I venture to say that there's a handful of us in this room that if there's a dollar amount that somebody could offer. When David even says in the Psalms, before Jesus Christ even comes, how priceless are your own love? And we can we can put a price tag. 
For God, there's no price tag, but for us, sometimes there might be. And that's the difference between his character and ours. Keep going with me in verse 8. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights, for with you is the fountain of life, and in your light we see light. I love the imagery. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. As reminding of Jesus' words when he's coming into Jerusalem in the New Testament, he goes, Oh, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you as a mother hand gathers your chicks. And you just get this image of Jesus' arms around you. And his arms reach as far as the east is from the west. And he wants you there. And you give him drink from your delights. Verses 8 and 9, how can you not see that I'm going to dwell with Jesus saying, if you would just ask, I'd give you water that never runs out. Because I am the fountain. And true happiness is only that which is in Christ. It encompasses both the physical and the spiritual. Go down with me, verse 10. David says, continue to love to those who know you, your righteousness, and to the upright in heart. You see, in verse 10, there's this confidence there's this confidence. And in verses 11 and 12, we can see a condemnation that goes along with it. However, the question is, is which side do you want to be on? Do you want to be on the confidence side or the condemnation side? And here's the great thing. The choice is yours. You get to choose. I get to choose. In verse 10, again, continue your love to those who know your righteousness. Continue your love, God. It never fails. Continue, and, and as the word, the word in the Hebrew means your loyal covenant, your covenant loyalty, excuse me, the same righteousness that is seen in the book of Job, chapter 1. Have you considered my servant Job, who is upright, blameless, shuns evil, and fears thee? Have you considered it? Upright. Upright. David says, help me. Help me in my time of trouble. He says, may your foot, may the foot of the proud not come against me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. David goes, God, help me. And I was reminded of the hand of God right here. I was just reminded of the hands of God right here. That's as you read through this this week. Again, last week I, I told you uh, about the Olympic record for like the, the, the one move, the whatever it's called. Yeah, the snap and whatever. I got this one. I looked up another one for you guys this week. Deadlift. You know what the deadlift record is? This is somebody just reaching down. And I got I to gotta tell you, this is without a belt and without hand grips. This is literally just reaching down, picking up the barbell with the weight on it, okay? No, no back support, no nothing. This is just reaching down and picking this up. The record for this is 1,015 pounds. The assisted with a belt is like 1,182 1, pounds. But think about it for just a second. You come upon a horse laying on the ground, and this is one of those guys that can just pick it up and move it out of the way. A horse! You're like, dude, can anybody be a horse? I got it. <laughs> Or a bear. <laughs> Seriously, like like a small adult horse weighs around a thousand pounds. A bear weighs around a thousand pounds. Some sharks weigh a thousand pounds. It's just, it's just. But why talk about deadlift? Because out of any move that they do in weightlifting competitions, it requires so much hand grip. It is the most demanding on the hands, and to keep that weight in hand. Did you know that God's word says that you're in the palm of his hands? He won't lose you. He won't leave you. He won't drop you. He won't forsake you. Amen. And if you have your Bibles, flip over to Isaiah 49. If you have your Bibles, flip over to Isaiah 49. I'm going to read a couple of verses earlier in verses 8, 9, and 10. 
Verse 49, chapter 49, verses 8 through 10. Look at what they say with me. This is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. And I will keep you and will make you to be the covenant for the people to restore the land, to reassign its desolation inheritance, and to say to the captives, come out, and to those in darkness, be free. <clears throat> and the New Testament says, those who looked upon Jesus saw light in the land of darkness. I continue to read. They will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat down on them. He who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. Now here it is. You move down a little bit to verse 16 and read verse 16 with me. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before. Listen. Listen, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you put your faith in Him, God says, Your name is on my hands. Amen. I am the deathless champion. There ain't nothing coming off of that. Verse 12, David says, Psalm 36, verse 12, See how the evil evildoers lie falling, thrown down, and not able to rise. <coughs> I want you to just focus on not able to rise for a second. Because a few weeks ago, I shared with you on Ephesians 6, how it talks about this word of standing firm. And when that word in the New Testament says to stand firm, it means you already have victory. It's yours. You are just waiting for either Jesus Christ to come back or us to meet him in glory. And it says right here in Psalm 36, verse 12. See how evildoers are falling, thrown down, not able to stand. It is the same word. That those who translated the Old Testament into the Greek, into the Septuagint, same Greek word for stand in Ephesians 6. If you don't have Jesus Christ, you're not going to stand. But with Jesus Christ, you're going to be on God's hand. I want you to think about it this morning as we get ready to close. And you know what? You know. Let's be honest. You know. Whether you're on that hand or not. You too. Picture God for just a second. On his throne. He's just looking at his hands. Oh, Consider my servant, Jim. Gets up there all nervous and all, but he still gives an amazing kind of meditation to lead everybody to Jesus. How awesome is that? Less. Spends all week at church camp. Spends one day with his wife. Then he goes off to another week away from his family. And he considered my servants, John and Holly DeWitt, who want to have a safe place for students to hang out all summer on a Friday night. So they used to get a little get together. He placed your name there in the ministry that you have. Just imagine God looking at that hand going, man, there you go. Now imagine if he looks down and he does the same thing there. And then you stand before him. And he goes, I got nothing for you. Jesus, you got anything? It's not air 
guess I just put my faith in Jesus Christ. Austin did that. Would you do that with him today? Would you put your faith in Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior and put yourself in the day? Heavenly Father, God, as we stand in your presence, as we lift holy hands, those of us who wish to, God, we pray that you, you alone, oh God, would remind us of your sovereignty, of your grace, of your mercy, God, and how we can stand in your love. And God, I pray today for the person, for the soul, for the image bearer of your, you, God. I pray today that they will accept the offer of grace. Father, for the heart in here this morning, who's accepted that grace, God, but they haven't lived like they know they should. And they just need help. And they want help, Father God. I pray that we as a church would surround them with love and help them, God. But the first thing is we've got to confess that we need help. And I pray this morning that the heart in this room who needs help would confess that up. And God, I give you the praise today in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come up here with me this morning. If you need prayer, please. Yeah, we can all stand together. That's awesome. Yeah. If you need prayer, please do not hesitate to come find these individuals and pray with them. They would love to pray with you and for you. And again, if you don't know Jesus, don't leave this place. No, I think it's great. Right.
riding the church bus van um, out to camp. Um, God bless you guys this week. Uh, I do not know who has closing prayer. I have closing to hold it. John, would you close this morning, brother?